Hello there and a very warm welcome. I am, my name is Jason Bryce and welcome along to Synergy Reiki Studio or to Jason's Meditation Journeys wherever you're joining us here. A very warm welcome to you. I hope you're good today. I'm going to consider sleep as a topic today. It's an important topic, of course, not just because of sleep, but because of the effect that sleep has upon our awake experience, our daytime experience. So we're going to consider some of the biology of sleep. We're going to consider many ways that would help you sleep easy. And we're also going to do a few meditations together today, uh, which will maybe help you relax and help you fall asleep. Maybe give you a few ideas of things that you might want to be doing uh, with your own practice. So it's time to get comfortable, to relax. You might want to grab yourself a nice glass of water or a cup of tea. Probably going to be about 40 minutes together here today. I hope you really enjoy. If you do, please give me the thumbs up, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube, and perhaps consider subscribing to my channel, Jason's Meditation Journeys, where you'll find many, many ah, meditations. It's a real eclecticism of meditation and information. So I hope everyone's enjoying the content this year, just trying to to build on it and give more varied content. Um, and today our topic is sleep. Sleep, mm. one of my favourite things to do, as much as I enjoy being awake, I do enjoy my bed. I do enjoy unwinding, relaxing, meditating, which I often do in bed and sleeping, of course. And um, I know how much I enjoy sleep when I don't get such a good sleep, when it's broken for whatever reasons that may be. Uh, the next day is always more challenging when we fail to get a good night's sleep. And especially if we go through a period where we're unable to sleep properly for a number of days, weeks, months, or even years uh, with people who suffer from insomnia or maybe have some kind of pain or circumstances mentally and emotionally that's stopping them from getting a good night's sleep. So if I'm, I'm speaking to you, uh, I, I hope this helps very much. And um, if you have any questions, simply put them in the chat underneath the YouTube video and I will come back and answer those questions for you. So sleep, yay. Um, I'm sure you enjoy to sleep as well. And the quality of your sleep does determine the quality of your awake time. And um, that's why I wanted to focus on this a little bit more and give some ideas and some practice that may help you a little bit. Most people require about eight hours of sleep a night. That's probably your average. When you're younger, you require a little bit more sleep. Um, especially babies, they sleep up to 70% of their day. Newborn babies are 75% of the day is spent sleeping because there's a lot of development happening. And it's similar as well with children who require more sleep than adults and teenagers because they're developing not only physically, but on a mental, cognitive level and emotionally as well. And of course, their behaviour is evolving and changing and they're learning so much. So a little bit more sleep is required there. As we get older, we probably require a little bit less sleep, especially during old age, when we may only sleep half what we slept when we were children or young adults. And it may be that cat naps are, are, are useful there. Uh, although I'm going to mostly discourage cat naps with my chat today and give you an alternative to a cat nap, which would make you feel a lot better. So we have eight hours sleep a night. On, on average, we have eight hours sleep a night. And during this, you have a sleep cycle. And um, this is characterized by periods of REM sleep, where you're dreaming and an active sleep, when your mind is at rest and your body is replenishing and recuperating and resetting. It's so important for it to do that, of course. Because when you sleep at night time, your nervous system has a chance to, to come into harmony. For example, 
the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, which helps you cope with stress, begins to settle down, and we go into parasympathetic arousal, in other words, calmer emotional states, uh, so that we're not just constantly on red alert, so to speak, our adrenals do slow down, much more on hormones later on, uh, but showing you why we need to sleep to reset our mind, to reset our body, so that we can be aware of stimuli and respond to them appropriately, learn and function as we do. So sleep allows us to function far better. And it's also, I think, a fairly enjoyable activity. I really enjoy my bed. I like going to bed at night. I like to meditate. I like to chill out just before sleep time. I enjoy that. And um, I always feel that I can cope with anything if I've got a good night's sleep behind me. And it makes such a difference, doesn't it, to the quality of your day in terms of your mood, in terms of your ability to be able to focus, concentrate, perceive things as they are, and so on. Sleep is absolutely essential. So we're going to just take a bit of a deeper dive into sleep today. Um, I'm going to talk about the biology of it, circadian rhythms, in a little bit. But I'm going to give you a couple of little hints and tips, first of all, um, before we get going with the biology of it. And then we'll do some practical We'll do some meditation. I'll show you a couple of techniques that you may wish to practice or consider before sleeping, particularly if you're finding it difficult to sleep. So first thing I would encourage anyone to do is have a sleep diary or a sleep journal to record their sleep behaviour, when they go to bed, when they wake up, perhaps even recording some dreams within your sleep journal. Dreams are fascinating, aren't they? Uh, because dreams are the subconscious way of uh, subconscious expressing, if you like, in your sleep and showing you perhaps what's going on on a deeper level. And I think what's most important about dreams is to pay attention to how you feel during your dream rather than the details of your dream. Because, of course, your mind's going to be replaying what it's experienced probably on that day before um, you slept the day that you sleep. But how you feel in your dream and what you're doing is less important, but how you feel is really your subconscious way, subconscious mind's way of showing you um, what's going on deeper within your psyche. So a sleep journal is a useful thing to do. And also then we start to notice patterns, um, you know, when it's best to go to sleep, when it's best to get up. And um, noticing that when we're consistent with our pattern, um, that we sleep better and we function better during the day. And when we have some later nights or interruptions to our sleep, then you're noticing how that makes you feel during the day. So you can use your sleep journal to, to log how you slept, when you slept, and also how you felt the next day to establish the patterns. And also to notice anything that's coming through with your dreams, any kind of information there. Um, and also lucid dreams, a really fascinating topic. When you become aware of yourself as the dreamer and you're able then to influence your dream. We'll talk about that a wee bit later on. But lucid dreams are quite amazing. Um, usually I would experience them on days where it's a day off, for example, and I've been through my sleep cycle many times and I've had enough sleep, but I just want to enjoy a little bit more sleep. And you have those dreams in the morning where you could wake up for a moment or two and you just decide to yourself, you know, um, I'm dreaming. I'm just going to go back into that uh, dream and maybe influence it in a particular way. And there's so many things that you can actually literally do, even when you're dreaming. It's quite incredible, isn't it? The human mind is absolutely fascinating. So no computer quite like it at all. <laughs> so sleep, sleep journaling, useful, definitely. Just to, to get the vibe, to get the patterns, to notice them. Um, also, you can talk about things that maybe you do, particular meditations or activities, how much coffee you drink or whatever it may be, when you drink alcohol, if you drink alcohol, noting those things down as well. 
uh, to see if they have an impact upon your sleep. Because they do. Everything has an impact upon your sleep. I know explain the whole circadian rhythm and probably about 10 minutes time to you. Music is very nice for getting to sleep. Some nice soft music, some classical music, some tones by neural beats are quite useful as well. Uh, because you can you can look them up and find frequencies that help you repair your DNA, repair your body, put you into an alpha state, put you into the theta state, uh, take you into gamma or delta brainwaves um, through vibrations and sounds, which can help you sleep as well. And also just focusing on the sound of relaxing, soothing music, very useful to get to sleep. Also, you can download the sound of rain falling, you can download singing balls, you can download cicadas. I personally love cicadas. That's probably where I first learned to meditate. I remember my, my nana taking me to Athens when I was young, I was particularly young. And um, when it was bedtime, of course, me being me, didn't want to go to bed um, at that age when I was younger, didn't want to miss out on anything when I was younger. I was talking about being a boy here. And um, when I did go to bed, what I did to try and get to sleep was listen to the sound of the cicadas, that shh, shh, shh sound that you hear in tropical or very warm countries. And listening to the sound of those insects uh, to me was very soothing. But what I recognized was I fell asleep really quite quickly even though my mind and body wanted to be in the company of my nana, my Aunt Maria, and so on. <laughs> so I learned to meditate, actually, by listening to the sound of the cicadas. And, and it only became more apparent to me that that's what I was doing as I consciously learned to meditate. Uh, so it's something that I just naturally did when I was a young boy, and it really helped me sleep. So focusing on a sound is really useful for sleep. In fact, make friends with any sound, especially when you're sleeping, because if you hear sounds that are, well, slightly more disturbing, that can put you off, such as a really strong wind outside, you know, maybe bins are blowing about and things, structures are getting loose, so you can hear the tiles moving on the roof. And I say that uh, because we're having a very stormy winter here in Scotland, and there's been many nights where many of us have been unable to sleep because of the wind. But if we kind of make friends with that sound, if we feel okay around that sound and just actually focus on the sound and just breathe into our body and feel it and be okay, make friends with this sound, then it's far less likely to keep you awake. And it could actually be useful to helping you nod off to sleep. Uh, so making, making friends with the surrounds sounds in your surroundings is, is, is definitely very, very useful. Sleep tracker apps, I think they're quite useful too. I don't have one myself, to be honest with you, um, but in speaking to many people who do, they quite enjoy looking at the quality of the sleep. And it's a good tool just to see just exactly how well you sleep, to look at your REM cycles, to, to look at how long they were, how deep they were, and so on see if you can make some further improvements to your sleep. Reading is a, a good old fashioned way of falling asleep, especially if you're reading something that's maybe familiar to you. It's not an engrossing story. It might be some factual information. It could be something that's completely boring. For me, I would tend to read something spiritual, uh, something about spiritual practice, um, something that I've read before, um, and I find that quite useful. My eyes just get heavy and I feel myself nodding off and it's a good way uh, to go to sleep. If you need something spiritual before you go to bed on gratitude or something like this, then obviously it's going to influence the quality of your sleep. And you're going to process that information when you get to sleep. A regular schedule, definitely so important and I'm going to speak much more about that when we talk about the biological mechanisms of sleep. A screen-free winding down period is very useful as well uh, because screens like you're looking at right now 
give off blue light and blue light affects your melatonin levels, reduces them and therefore tricks your body into thinking it's still daytime. So it's always advisable to avoid TV, computers and phones later at night time or turn the brightness right down or adjust the setting on your phone so that it's more kind for your eyes if you have to. Personally, why would you be doing work or research just before you go to sleep? Um, and if you are using some apps or some sounds or vibrational information from say YouTube or uh, Spotify or wherever you do your thing, um, then turn down the brightness and, and um, even have the screen on dark so that it's not disturbing you, not disturbing your sleep. Um, cooler colours are useful for sleeping as well, uh, for your bedroom or perhaps as well um, how you dress your bed. Less clutter is better as well, as it always is for everything that we do. We concentrate better when there's less clutter, but we also sleep better when there's less clutter and absolutely separating daytime stuff from sleep. So in our home, our bedroom is for sleeping and relaxing, resting, meditating. It's for that. It's not for work. It's not for talking about business. It's not for talking about relationships. It's not for doing any of that daytime stuff. In fact, my attitude is when I go upstairs to my bed, I close the door, my phone's away from me. That's me shut the world out. It's like, no. And if the world comes back in, as in I start to think about things, then I remind myself that this is my sacred time to relax, meditate, sleep, rest, recuperate, and re-energize myself, reset for tomorrow. And it's just a nice wee kind reminder to myself that, you know, well, we do that all day and I'm here now to rest and relax and to sleep. Temperature of your bedroom can influence how well you sleep as well. I know females like it warmer in bed. Males generally tend to like it cooler for sleep uh, and have their feet hanging out the duvet and such like. The ideal temperature for your bedroom, I think, is 16 to 19 degrees. So that's 61 to 68 Fahrenheit. Uh, and I think that we sleep better with slightly cooler temperatures. You know yourself, when we ever have a summer heat wave, and it gets warm and humid at night. It's not so much the heat wave during the day that gets to people. It's more the fact that they can't sleep with the heat at night and don't get to cool down um, that causes the body then to become stressed during the heat wave, especially abroad where the temperature might be in the 30s or even the 40s. So getting a nice cool environment for sleeping is most helpful. I like to leave the bedroom window open but again, it just depends upon noise levels in your location. Mindfulness is a great tool for getting to sleep as well. Whether you just become mindful of your breathing, mindful of your thoughts, or perhaps what you do as a mindful practice where you scan your body, locate and label any areas of tension or discomfort, breathe into those feelings, until they disobey, until they relinquish, until you feel your body to be nice, soft and relaxed. And then just do some breathing and that may help you nod off to sleep as well. In doing that, you're actually processing whatever you've experienced during the day because there we're feeling rather than thinking. So we're just going into the feeling and it's okay to, to label or locate where we're experiencing tension uh, but don't think about it if you can. Avoid thinking about it. Just breathe into the feeling until it softens and disappears altogether and your body feels nice and relaxed and then you're ready for some sleep. Uh, releasing a little bit of weight can be useful too. No offence, but um, the heavier we are, then the more likely we are to have sleeping difficulties, including snoring. Work out an exercise earlier in the day. I think that's quite important uh, when it comes to sleep. So 
you know, people go to the gym after work at night or in the evening. But if you were to go to the gym in the morning before work or work out or exercise or walk, the most ideal exercise for good sleep is walking. If you were to do that earlier in the day, then you're preparing yourself to sleep a little bit earlier at night. And if you do your workout or your routine later on, then of course you're just pumping your body up, you're getting your endorphins going, and you're hyping your body up, and it's going to take that bit longer to relax. The more exercise we do during the day, and especially earlier in the day, the better quality of sleep we have. That's one reason I love walking and going big, big walks, you know, four, five, six hour walks. The sleep, the quality of my sleep is fantastic when I do that. It's such a good exercise. It aligns your spine. It's not too much for you. Um, unless, you know, you're climbing mountains every day. Uh, it's a great way to exercise and a brilliant way to sleep at night. But try and do that workout, whatever it may be, earlier on in the day rather than during the evening. That will help you sleep there. Some aromatherapy may be useful. You may burn some oils uh, in your bedroom before you go to sleep. A little bit of lavender, for example. But just bear in mind something like lavender um, that you might want to apply liberally to get to sleep. Actually, when we, when we have more lavender than we should, it will go the other way and it could actually stimulate you. Uh, and quite a lot of things work that way. Um, so watching not to overdo it, essentially there. Herbal teas could be useful as well. Caramel is a brilliant one to help you relax at night time before you sleep. I would say generally cut out cat naps. I'm going to refer to something else you can do. Uh, but cat naps do disrupt your circadian rhythm big time. And what we're talking about in this session here is getting a more consistent pattern of sleep. And okay, occasionally it's all right to have a later night or have a lie in. That's absolutely fine. But if you think about it, having a cat nap is, is like, it's almost like having two days. So you get up in the morning and then you have your cat nap and you get up again. Um, you might not feel that alert when you awaken for the second time. So if you're having a cat nap and they do work for you, as they do for some people, and especially if you didn't get a good night's sleep previously, make sure your cat nap's quite small, 20 minutes, half an hour, so that you're not going into a second sleep cycle or waking up feeling a little bit more groggy. But I'll give you a really good alternative or two for cat naps, which you can do in your bed as well. Uh, and it might feel a wee bit like a cat nap, but you feel much better for it. Um, yay. Gratitudes. Mmm. Gratitude's wonderful. It's something that I love doing. I don't know about you, uh, but it's better to lose count while naming your blessings than to lose your blessings to counting your troubles. <laughs> you can count sheep if you want to, but I think counting gratitudes is much more productive. And of course, if you think about why you're grateful for anything to have happened in that day or at any point in your life, then what you're doing is manifesting a wee bit more of that into your life as well. Um, but a grateful heart is an open heart. And when your heart's open and you feel love and gratitude, generally you're feeling quite relaxed as well. It's a great antidote to stress, for example, and it actually has quite an effect upon hormones and your whole physiology, as we'll talk about in a wee bit. Getting into nature will help you sleep as well. Getting off devices will most definitely help you sleep. And if you're a parent and you're watching this and you're thinking about your children, yeah, I think I think managing their time on the internet is pretty important. Uh, and I would definitely have a curfew. Um, if I had children, I would have a curfew. There'd be a certain point in the day where internet is no longer permitted. Um, at, rather than lying in bed, gaming or doing something, uh, because that really disrupts sleep. Um, it might be social media or whatever, uh, but that really does disrupt sleep. Children really need a good sleep. Young people really need a good sleep. 
students need a good sleep as well. Um, yeah, enough said on that. Uh, caffeine intake. Caffeine has a half-life of six hours. So if you have a cup of tea or coffee, six o'clock in the evening, then half of that caffeine or taurine is still active in your system at midnight. And a quarter of that cup of coffee is still active in your system at 6 a.m. the following morning. Uh, so maybe limiting caffeine intake. Don't know about you, I enjoy a cup of two coffee or three or four, especially in the morning. But when it comes to the afternoon, I'm thinking, right, this is my last one for the day. And it's very rare I would have a coffee in the evening. Extremely rare that that happens. Uh, it has been known to, um, but generally speaking, caffeine is going to overstimulate you and take you a bit longer to get to sleep. Alcohol. Alcohol will never help you sleep better. Um, not even one drink will help you sleep better. Alcohol has a negative effect upon your sleep. Your sleep quality changes dramatically with alcohol. And if you drink something like red wine, um, which might be very nice with a meal, but red wine, again, with the tannin in it, it's a bit of a stimulant and it doesn't really allow you to get a long sleep. So you might wake up feeling a little bit tender. Um, that's one of the reasons that people find red wine to be, um, well, um, <laughs> hangover inducing. If you do shift work, then blackout curtains, definitely um, get yourself in the darkest room and, and the quietest room possible for you. More, more on light and a wee bit. Um, know your own sleep posture, know the best sleep posture for you. And can I also advise you to get a really good pillow or two? Uh, I, I'm looking forward to buying myself a real smart pillow. So um, um, because Normal pillows, you have to replace them after three months. You'll notice yourself, it doesn't matter where you get them from, the, the quality of them really deteriorates and it can cause neck problems, spine problems and all sorts. Um, so maybe consider buying yourself a smart pillow. Um, and they're, they're kind of funny shaped, but a funny shape to make sure that your spine is in its correct alignment as you sleep because that's so important for you as well. Um, so not just the sheets, not just the quilt, not just the temperature, but also the pillow and definitely the mattress. Um, some people have the same mattress as they had 10 years ago, um, which is less than ideal, less than ideal. Your mattress should be changed no longer than eight years. And um, I think some people like it, the mattress to be quite firm. Other people enjoy memory foam. We've got a memory foam one. It works for us. Everyone's different. Some people with sort of backs like orthopedic ones that are a bit more firm and will support you. But whatever way you like it, please renew it um, every five to eight years, a new mattress, if possible. No pets in the bed if you want a consistent sleep. But I know what it feels like to want to cuddle your pet at night time, uh, your dog or your cat and have cuddles. Um, but if they're big and they're in your bed and they're moving about, it's going to disturb you, isn't it, during your sleep? Uh, so for the purposes of sleeping well, it's probably better that you sleep with yourself or just your partner rather than the pets as well. Um, in terms of supplements, I don't recommend anything to be honest with you. Um, but what I will say, something that is um, very useful is magnesium. Now, if you're a fan of nuts, and in particular cashew nuts, you know, the ones that you crack open the shell, cashew nuts are full of, of, of magnesium. They have calcium in them too, and many, many things. In fact, there's many nuts that will actually help you sleep. The compounds in them, the amino acids in them, and how they influence hormones and other compounds in our body. So go nuts before you go to sleep. There are a few nuts, such as cashew nuts, that would really help you sleep. 
um, by making sure that you're getting the right minerals and elements and what your body needs for a good night's sleep. And I would say calomel as well. Calomel tea. I'm quite a fan of that. Okay, so there's some hints and tips of how to sleep a wee bit better. And it's definitely experimental and that's why we started off with the journal. Um, but let me speak a little bit now before we go into practice on the circadian rhythm. All, all organisms have a circadian rhythm. It's our internal clock. It's our way of measuring time. Uh, I'm going to start off with plants, actually. What? But I'm going to start off with plants because I think this demonstrates the point really nicely. A plant will measure darkness, not light. So a plant will measure the duration of the night. So it's February. Well, I'm recording this just now. It's early February. Uh, it's the 10th of February. And at the moment, light levels are starting to go up. And I've noticed just that the, the crocus all coming out and the snowdrops in our garden. Now, what's determining that? Partly temperature, of course. Uh, there's less frost, maybe. So the temperature's warming up a little bit. The soil temperature's going up a wee bit. But actually, it's the duration of the nighttime period um, that's been detected because so as soon as those leaves shoot up, then they are measuring the length of night, not day, night, uh, because daytime can be interrupted by darker periods. So it would be a little bit useless measuring the length of the day. There could be like a heavy shower, a thunderstorm, or during the winter, it might never properly become light when you've always got some kind of background light on. So we actually measure darkness, not, not daytime. So let me bring you to being human again. <laughs> All organisms have a circadian rhythm. We really need to know um, that rhythm. And we work with rhythms. And everything is cyclic. When you start to think about it, everything is cyclic. Like the moon cycle, the menstrual cycle, the seasons, and it's so good to tune in to cyclic events, you know, um, and our body measures them and responds to them, of course. So let's start the story with when you go to sleep at night. Um, and just before you go to sleep, so long as you're not exposing yourself to light or blue light in particular from your computer, what happens is that the pineal gland, which is a structure just there, um, if you think of your third eye there, the pineal gland is opposite that at the back of your head. It was a mysterious structure, you could say, uh, to early philosophers and psychologists. One thing it does is produce melatonin. And melatonin is a hormone that helps you regulate your circadian rhythm and feel sleepy. So as soon as it becomes dark, the body produces melatonin to help you feel sleepy so is that you sleep at the right time of the day. Simple. It's got evolutionary um, purpose to it uh, because it keeps you safe at night by withdrawing and being and sleeping um, and also helps you utilise the day and the light during the day. So your body produces melatonin and it helps you feel sleepy and you fall asleep during the night. But when it starts to become light in the morning, even if you have your eyes shut, then melatonin production goes down. It drops significantly. So the photoreceptors in your eyes can actually detect light with your eyes closed, so long as you've not got a duvet right over your head. That's always going to be a given. So sometimes exposing yourself to a little bit of light, like having a lamp come on or an actual daylight lamp come on, maybe half an hour before you're due to get up in the morning and just allowing that to come on with the timer, that can be really useful um, because it reduces your melatonin levels. And then as soon as you open your eyes, melatonin goes down, but something else goes up. Adenosine. We produce this chemical called adenosine from the moment we start to wake up. And the longer you're awake, the more adenosine your body has and produces. 
and it's a signal for getting to sleep. So we want adenosine production to happen early on in the day because that primes us to get to sleep a little bit earlier in the evening. But something else is really important, to get some natural daylight around you. And I don't mean looking out the window to see that it's light. I mean, when you get up in the morning, you know, within your first few minutes, if you can, get outside, go outside. You know, whether it be cloudy, and especially when the sun is low on the horizon, if you are exposed to natural daylight, then your body produces what's called a cortisol pulse. And if we produce a cortisol pulse early in our day, it actually programs us to get to sleep earlier in the evening or night, which is what we're trying to do here, of course. So if you can, it's what I do. It's what I do, especially spring, summer and autumn. Sometimes during winter, sometimes I just stand at the door and look out, listen to the birds or whatever. But my routine, spring, summer and autumn, you know, from February, late February onward, would be to get up, have a cuppa, take it outside. Even in days that are less good, I just put my coat on and go outside. And I do a little meditating, perhaps, with my eyes open. I have my coffee outside. I, I maybe practice some gratitude get my day started. It's the best way to start the day. And most importantly, I've exposed my eyes to proper daylight. Um, it's 50 times less effective if you do it in the house. So it's really useful to get outside and get some natural daylight about you first thing. So then it creates a cortisol pulse, which will help you then sleep better in the evening. If we shift our exercise to earlier in the day, if we shift our food intake to earlier in the day as well, then we will sleep easier as well. It's better to have a longer fasting period um, rather than eating round the clock. So it's quite useful to not eat over a 16 hour period of the day, for example. Um, mm, but the general vibe here is have breakfast, have lunch, have your dinner and your supper quite early so that there's a bigger fasting period break from eating. That's wonderful. Okay. I would say as well, avoid light during the night. Okay. Because it causes a, a phase delay, especially, essentially. Um, so if you get up during the night and you look at your phone or decide I'm going to have a wee shot my laptop, then you're exposing yourself to blue light. And as I said at the beginning of this recording, it's mucking up your circadian rhythm because it's almost like it's the next day when it's not really. And it takes a wee while then for your cortisol um, levels to go down, for your melatonin levels to go up as well. Also, if you are an insomniac, and probably 90% of insomniacs have very high cortisol levels, I refer to the cortisol pulse first thing in the day. And cortisol is essential, it's produced from your adrenal glands, and the adrenals are essentially part of your autonomic nervous system. Well, they are the endocrine glands that give you energy or help you fight or flight. They help you survive. So they give you a little boost of energy when you need it. Um, so we want to be careful with that. And if you work a lot or you're not unwinding properly before bedtime and your cortisol levels are quite high as you go to bed, then it will take you a while to go to sleep. Um, so you maybe want to do something to reduce your stress and to reduce your cortisol levels as much as you can. And I would say general rule of thumb is cortisol is, is less of an issue unless you've been exposed to a lot of stress over a long period of time. And I would maybe go as far as calling that anxiety when stress just isn't 
allowed to switch off and we eventually become addicted to it, believe it or not. And we become that used to it that if we don't have it, we don't feel like ourselves and we crave it and we create circumstances that bring more stress, anxiety into our body. Uh, ultimately, that's going to raise your cortisol levels and it could take hours to get sleep if your cortisol levels are too high. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier catnap, so um, you could have a rest during the day, maybe say three o'clock in the afternoon when your energy may be dipped naturally anyway. Most people's energies do dip at some point in the afternoon and then we seem to have a wee second wind, so to speak. Um, personally, my energy levels um, are fairly consistent and that's probably because I try to sleep consistently as well. Um, I come to my own time, <laughs> and my own pace, uh, and I generally become more and more alert as we move uh, through the early morning period to mid-morning. And then I find my kind of plateau and I'm usually there until kind of eight o'clock in the evening and I start to then dip down and unwind. For me, that's just perfect. That's great. Some people have a few dips during the day. They might get tired, say after lunchtime, after a big meal, or they might feel tired middle of afternoon. So if you can't nap, it would generally be what, one o'clock, two o'clock, three, it's probably an ideal time if you were, if you have to cat nap. Um, but what you could do is consider something else to do instead of sleeping um, that involves resting. Um, for example, you might want to do some meditation or you could do a little bit of hypnosis or you could do some, so create some guided imagery. Um, Nindra, yoga Nindra is fantastic for that and that's where you adopt a yoga pose and you run some imagery through your mind, some positive imagery. And these techniques, these meditative techniques or hypnotic techniques or yoga techniques where you may remain completely conscious actually help you feel as if you've had a cat nap but it's not breaking your circadian rhythm and interrupting it quite the same way and it's very very useful okay um thanks for sticking with the video it's been more extended than I thought it was going to be. I'm just going to take you through a few meditations now that might be useful to you to help you sleep. And the first one is a breathing technique and it's called the four, seven, eight breath. And what we're doing essentially here, and we're going to practice in a moment, I'm just going to talk you through it for a few minutes. What we do is we inhale for four, we hold the breath for seven, and then we release the breath for eight, and I'm talking about measurements of seconds here. So breathing in for four seconds, holding the breath for seven seconds, and exhaling for eight seconds. That's a fantastic way to clear stress, anxiety, anger, rage, or any, excuse me, any heightened emotions. It's most ideal to do that, and it will help you sleep. In fact, what it's kind of doing is it's kind of emptying your heart a little bit of blood, which then sends a signal to your nervous system and it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps you relax that little bit. It's a, it's a very clever technique. And what we do is we do it 10 times. So we may wish to practice this together just now, if you want to just make yourself comfortable. And what we're going to do is breathe in through our nose for four, counting four. Hold the breath for seven. And then release the breath through your mouth now for eight, making a whooshing sound. Punting your lips. Fantastic. Breathing in for four through your nose. 
Hold the breath for seven. And release the breath for eight through your mouth, making a wishing sound. Pursing the lips there. Beautiful. Breathing in for four. Holding the breath for seven. And releasing the breath for eight through your mouth, making that wishing sound. Breathing in for four through your nose. Holding for seven. And releasing the breath for eight through your mouth, making the wishing sound. Breathing in for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Breathe in for four. Hold for seven. And exhale for eight. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. And exhale for eight. And let's do one final round. Inhaling for four. Hold for seven. And release for eight. And if you like to relax the breathing and the effort and all the counting, breathe normally and just notice how you feel in this moment now. Are you feeling a little bit more relaxed? It's definitely a good technique and very, very useful if you're trying to get to sleep. Of course, you can do more than 10 rounds if you want to, if that works for you, but that's a great way to get going. Another thing to do, which I think is really useful, lying down is progressive muscle relaxation. So I'm just going to talk you through that now. So you might want to get yourself comfortable. You might want to lie down, pause the video for a moment, grab yourself a blanket and get nice and comfortable. And just take a moment to relax into the space that you're in just now, noticing the contact between your body and whatever may be supporting you. Perhaps noticing the contact between your clothes and your skin or the blanket and your body. That's beautiful. So what we're going to do is exhale first of all and then tense up our feet. Really tense your feet up. Now take a nice deep breath in through your nose. Deep as you can. And as you exhale through your mouth, release the tension in your feet. Ah, just imagine any tension flowing out your feet like a fountain of water flowing into the earth below. And allow your body to relax. Keeping your eyes closed. Breathing. And now we're going to tense our feet, but also tense the muscles of our legs. And I invite you to take another slow, deep breath in through your nose, breathing in as deeply as you can into your tummy. Breathing in a little bit more if you can. And as you exhale through your mouth, allow all that tension to go. Let your muscles relax in your legs and feet and imagine a fountain of tension flowing out your feet into the earth below. And allow your whole self to relax, dropping any effort, allowing the muscles of your body to be soft and supple.
And we're going to, once again, tense our feet, tense the muscles of our legs, and this time our buttocks as well. And I invite you to take a nice deep breath in through your nose, breathing deep into your tummy. And as you exhale, release that tension from your buttocks, your legs and your feet. Release the tension with the breath and just imagine any tension flowing out your feet like a little fountain flowing into the earth below. And allow yourself to relax again. Relax your body and allow your breathing to return to normal. I invite you again to tense up your feet, your legs, your buttocks, and this time your tummy and digest the system and take a nice deep breath in through your nostrils, deep into your tummy. Really tensing those areas up, breathing as deeply as you possibly can into your tummy and now release the breath slowly through your mouth, releasing all tension, allowing your tummy to relax, your buttocks, your legs, your feet. And just imagine any tension flowing out your feet like a fountain flowing into the air. That's beautiful. And again, drop any effort, any counting, any tension. Breathe normally and relax. And now I invite you to tense up your chest, your digestive system, your buttocks, your legs and your feet. Take a nice deep breath in through your nose, breathing deep into your tummy, deep into your centre. Take as deep a breath as possible as you tense these areas up as much as you can. And now relax your body, release the tension through the breath. Let yourself go and just imagine any, any tension flowing out your feet like a fountain of water flowing into the earth below. Drop all effort. Be present in your body. And now I invite you to tense up your shoulders and your neck, your chest, your digestive system, your buttocks, your legs and your feet and breathe deeply in through your nose, deep into your tummy. Really tensing and clenching all those areas of your body and now release with the breath. Let your muscles go. Feel the tension relieve and release and relinquish from your body through your breath and imagine any tension flowing out your feet like little water fountains flowing into the ground. Let your whole body and all the muscles in your body completely relax. Breathe in normally the next 30 seconds. I now invite you to tense up your arms and your hands to really clench them and your shoulders and neck and your chest, digestive system, buttocks legs and feet, breathing in deeply through your nose once more, deep into your stomach, deep into your, your center. And release the breath through your mouth and allow your whole body to relax, allow all that tension to release and imagine little fountains of energy coming out your feet like water, releasing that tension going into the ground. Beautiful. And one final round, tensing your face, tensing your arms and your hands, tensing your shoulders and neck, tensing your chest and your digestive system, tensing your buttocks, your legs and your feet and breathing in deeply through your nose. Keeping the tension as strong as you can and now release of the out breath. Let your whole body go, let your 
whole body relax. Beautiful. And just imagine any remaining tension blowing out your feet like little fountains of water into the earth. There we have it. Just take a wee moment to notice how you feel. Have a little drink of water. I could give many more techniques, but not in this occasion. I'll say one more little thing if you're a Reiki person to work on your solar plexus or your sacral chakra down below your navel will help you sleep more easily. Uh, that's where I would go in terms of Reiki positions if I found it difficult to sleep during the night. I hope that was helpful to you. Please let me know. I love a little bit of feedback if you've enjoyed the video and uh, look out for more appearing on the channel soon. I hope you have a beautiful day and thanks again for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, all the very best. My love to everyone and hopefully see you again soon.